Hello, welcome back to the introduction to music appreciation. In our last lesson, we started looking at the elements of music, beginning with some basics on tone color and dynamics, which helps us get to the next step, learning about the different instruments of the orchestra. However, before we even talk about instruments, we're going to talk about sound. And the big question is, of course, what is it? Well, I went out and checked to get some definitions of sound, and it turns out it does have two definitions. The first one, in physics, sound is a vibration that propagates as a typically audible mechanical wave of pressure and displacement through a medium such as air or water. And the second one, in physiology and psychology, sound is the reception of such waves and their perception by the brain. So what does this mean? In the case of music, sound is basically a disturbance in the air. Our ears receive those disturbances and our brain interprets them. So the next question is, how do musical instruments make sound? We're going to take a little field trip and we're going to find out. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Bible and this is my studio. And this is my prized possession. It's my piano. It's a 1914 Chickering Upright. And I bought it when I was maybe 22 or 23 years old when I was going to college and I needed something to practice on at home. I was finally living off campus, which was awesome, but I had no place to practice and I didn't want to drive all the way back to the school and go fight for a practice room. So I bought this beautiful piano for a reasonable price and I have loved it ever since. And now, of course, I give lessons on it as well as do my practicing. And I want to show you the inside of the piano today. This is something that I used to do when I was a little girl, when I was taking lessons on various pianos that my parents rented or bought, depending on where we were. And I would take the piano apart and I would hit the keys and see how it worked on the inside. That was really fascinated. And of course, now I can use that experience to teach you. So the first thing I have to do is to open everything up, which is what I'm going to do now. Okay, so now you can see I have taken off the front panel of the piano and I put it over there and it's very heavy. I probably should have waited until my husband was home to do this. And I have opened it up and I dusted it a little because there's dirt that gets in there and I just want to show you how it works. It's really neat. Pretty basically, when I hit a key, a hammer, that one right there, will strike not just one string, but a group of strings. That's pretty interesting to me, being a musician who's gone to a lot of years of college. Um, as a kid, I never understood why it hit more than one string. I just thought it was kind of cool, but I didn't know why. Now I know that that's going to give it a richer sound if more than one string is struck. You can also see, as we go all the way down the line here, that the strings are a lot thicker. And I'm going to get some close-ups here in a little bit so we can look over that as well. But it's really neat. Down here we have big fat strings. And as we go higher, the strings start to get skinnier. So down here on this end, we have a big, one big fat string. It's wound around with other strings. And then as we go further over, the strings get skinnier until you get way down here. And anyone with good ears in our audience can tell that this piano is not quite in tune. This was built in 1914, Chickering Brothers, Cap Acoustic Grand, kind of cool, and it is a grand piano. So when you see those big, beautiful grand pianos and they're really spread out, well, they basically took all those strings and sort of overlapped them on top of each other to fit them into this piano. And I remember when I moved from Texas to where I am now, I got the piano and all the keys had been jammed over to one side. So apparently the people moving it had dropped it on its side at one point. And I had a tutor come in and she fixed the keys for me and she told me the piano was pretty much still in tune. 
because she said these pianos were meant to go cross country in the back of a covered wagon. They're really, really sturdy. And I love this piano and I'm never getting rid of it. Maybe someday I'll have the guts redone and uh, it'll hold a tune better, but I don't know. It even has um, on the keys real ivory mixed in with fake ivory where keys have been repaired. And of course you can't buy a piano anymore with real ivory keys. So that's just something to think about too. Pretty neat piano. So I'm going to come over there and I'm going to get the camera and we're going to take a closer look at how this thing works. All right. So now we're a lot closer to the piano and hopefully you can see that the strings over here are much thicker. It's like one string wound around with a big thick string. And as we go to the right, the strings get smaller. They're wrapped and wrapped and they're wrapped and then it gets smaller and smaller till we get to this section over here where there are no longer wrapped strings. So these are three strings that are wrapped, three strings here, two strings that are wrapped more thickly, two strings, two strings, one string that's wrapped really thickly and on down the line here. Then we get over here and we have three strings that are not wrapped, okay? And if we keep going down the line, we'll see that the strings get skinnier and skinnier and they also get shorter. So way down here, you can see that my piano needs a little TLC. This hammer's not bouncing back. So basically what happens is I press a key, in this case a very low C. The hammer strikes the string and it immediately backs up just enough. You can't really see it from your angle. It backs up just enough to let it ring. It's pretty cool. Right? When I get here, the sound is getting higher. Woo! Out of tune piano! Yeah, I know, right? Like I said, this piano is my baby, uh, but I don't have the money to get it completely gutted and fixed. So, what are you gonna do, right? I don't care. I still love this piano. It's got a lot of character. But you can see how it works. So we have, very important, the strings that vibrate when the hammer strikes them. And there is action down in the piano down here that I can make the string vibrate even after I pick up my finger and everything blends together. Or I can hit the pedal that makes sure it doesn't do that. <laughs> I'm not, ooh, and you can see what it does to the hammers there. All right, and that hammer that doesn't want to let go. It's a good thing that I never sing anything or teach anything that uses that note because it's obviously not working on my piano. So again, we have strings that vibrate, and then of course we have this big beautiful instrument that makes sure that the sound just doesn't sit there. It vibrates out into the room. Imagine, if you will, a harp where somebody plucks the strings, which of course does sound different, but it certainly doesn't have this big booming sound. Well, part of that is because we have a sound box and we have an instrument that is built to distribute that sound, to amplify the sound. So it's pretty cool. Hopefully that starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, one question a lot of people want to know is the piano, a string instrument, because it uses strings, or is it a percussion instrument? Because the hammers strike the strings, like if we were playing a drum. And the question is, it depends on who you're talking to. Um, a lot of people just admit that it's got aspects of both. I will be teaching it in its own separate category, so just so you know that. So anyway, there's a little tour of my piano, and I hope you have enjoyed it. You can see that this is a really, really old piano, and I've done some repair work on it when it got bounced up in the move, but I will never get rid of it. This is my beloved piano. So what did we see here about how the piano creates the sound? Well, first thing, your finger will play the key, and that key is attached to a hammer, which then hits the string and causes the string to vibrate. And that vibrating string makes a sound, remember, causing a disturbance in the air. It makes a sound, 
And then you think, okay, that's a skinny little string. How does it make such a loud sound? Well, if you remember from what I said in the video, the soundboard and the wood of the piano help to amplify the sound. Our ears receive the sound, basically the vibrations travel into our eardrum, and then, well, we put those notes together in a pattern, and we call it a melody, and that sound becomes music. So just a little piano music for you there, so you know what it's capable of in the hands of somebody who's really talented. I'm a singer. I don't play that well at all. I'm lucky if I can play scales for my students, and that's about it. So let's think about other instruments. How do they work? Let's think of mm, the guitar. The finger is going to pluck a string. The string is going to vibrate, disturbances in the air. How is that sound going to be amplified? the wood of the guitar. And of course, then our ears receive the sound. How about the voice? Okay, well, we basically blow air through our vocal cords, which then vibrate. And what amplifies the sound? It's our bodies. For a singer, your body is your instrument, which can make things difficult if you're sick. All right, then of course, our ears receive the sound. So. What do they all have in common? What do they need to make that sound? Well, we need an energy source. Lungs to blow the air, to sing the notes. Maybe finger power to pluck the strings or push the keys. That'd be more like muscular power there. Then we need something that vibrates or causes the air to vibrate, basically. Something like strings, vocal cords. And then finally, we need something that amplifies the sound. So we have the wood or other material of the instrument, or something like our bodies. Obviously, not every instrument sounds or looks alike. Check out how different these instruments look. But there are those that are similar in how they're built, how they produce sound, and how they sound. So we have construction, acoustics, and timbre or tone color to help us figure out the parameters for different instruments. So within these parameters, the instruments of the orchestra are divided into four main sections or families. But before we get to, into breaking down the orchestra into sections, let's remind ourselves how the full orchestra sounds when everyone is playing together. So that's a little snippet of a piece called The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra by an English composer named Benjamin Britten. And it gives us the chance to hear a melody first played by the whole orchestra and then in each section. So we're going to come back to that same piece played by different sections. So let's break down the orchestra into its four sections. Okay, when you think of the symphony, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For some of you, that may be something like a violin, which are part of the string section, which is basically the foundation of the orchestra. Let's take a look at those parameters for the string family, construction, acoustics, and timbre, starting with construction. So the instrument is traditionally made of wood and is strung with several strings. And looking at acoustics, the player uses a special bow that's made with horsehair and pulls or scrapes the bow across the strings to make the sound, to make them vibrate. The energy source is going to be the player's arms and their muscles in their arms. And the vibration, of course, is going to be the strings. And the amplifier is going to be the wood of the instrument. Now, I'm not going to talk about electronic instruments, which are a whole different thing, until we get 
into each instrument family specifically by itself. There'll be a lesson just on strings, there'll be a lesson just on something else. So just keep that in mind as we're going forward. Okay, let's talk about timbre. Let's listen to the entire string section playing that same melody together. And that was kind of cool because you got to hear the whole string section playing together and then they played a little bit and got lower and lower and lower with the lower instruments in the string section. So that's pretty awesome there. All right, that is one instrument section of the orchestra. What other instruments can you think of that play in the orchestra? You might think, how about the trumpet? Which is a nice, loud, and shiny instrument in the brass section. With the string family, you could see that each instrument is very similar in design, except they are different sizes. So you can see in this picture that we have four different instruments and they basically look the same. The bigger the instrument, the lower the sound is. The brass section is very different. Instruments in the brass family don't all look like different versions of each other, different sizes of each other. Although we will see that some kind of do that when we get into more detail. You can see here that the middle picture basically looks like the same kind of instrument in different sizes. But then you look at the pictures around it and you think, okay, those are completely different shapes. They have different ways of making the notes change. We've got the trombone with the slide. We got French horns with little keys. So we're gonna check that out. Let's take a look at the construction of brass instruments and see why they are grouped together. The brass instruments, of course, are generally made of brass and sometimes plated in gold or silver. So you're not gonna see just brass trumpets. You will see silver trumpets, silver trombones, and so on. Acoustically, the brass family depends upon buzzing lips to start the sound. So basically, which if I do it just by itself, it sounds like I'm just being really rude. But if you do that buzzing sound and blow that air buzzily into a mouthpiece, then you start to get something different. And when you attach that mouthpiece then to the big instruments, voila, you've got the brass section. So let's talk about the energy source. Of course, that's going to be air from the lungs as well as the tightening of the lips. It's not just the lungs that are pushing the air out. Those lips have to tighten to get that rude little noise to come out. The vibrations, of course, are coming from the air buzzing across the lips, making the rude noise, and then the amplification is going to start with the mouthpiece and travel through the entire instrument. The mouthpiece begins the amplification and then the rest of the instrument takes over. Attaching the mouthpiece to the rest of the instrument and you get the unique sound from each member of the brass family. We can get something really bright and majestic like the trumpet and we can get something super mellow like the French horn and we'll get into more of those in a later lesson. Now for timbre, let's go ahead and listen to the brass section. Okay, two sections down and two to go. So let's talk about another family of instruments that uses a combination of air and lip tension. Any ideas? Well, that would be the woodwinds. And they're called woodwinds because originally they were all made of wood, except for the saxophones, which are a much more modern instrument. These days, some of the woodwinds are made of wood and some are made of metal. All have finger holes as well as keys so the player can get a larger range more easily. Let's look at those parameters. Construction. The instrument is made of wood or metal with finger holes and keys. For instance, the clarinet, generally made of wood, although some starter instruments are often made of plastic. I know I played the clarinet when I was in the sixth grade. I started playing the clarinet and we rented a clarinet. Nowadays, you can go and buy plastic clarinets to get started. How about the flute? Flutes 
started out made of wood and they didn't have all the keys and little finger pads and they just had holes but adding those things made it possible to get all sorts of different pitches so there's a much greater range and they're almost always made out of metal then you have something like the saxophone which has always been made out of metal as i said it's a much more modern instrument all right let's talk acoustics for the woodwinds the musician is going to blow into or across a mouthpiece so you can see here i've pointed out the mouthpieces for you for instruments like the clarinet and the saxophone the player is going to buzz a special reed that is part of the mouthpiece and it's going to vibrate to produce a particular sound other woodwinds actually have two reeds it's kind of hard to see in this picture but that's actually two reeds connected back to back and you can see it's a much different kind of shape than the other one is and this is the reeds for the oboe bassoon and english horn and they're definitely a different kind of sound so they will buzz the reeds in the mouthpiece and the reeds will vibrate and produce different sounds then you have the flute which has a mouthpiece that you actually blow across to produce the vibrations kind of like blowing across the top of a bottle so what do we have here the energy source is lungs again and lip tension in various ways and what's vibrating well this is a little different for the different instruments in the woodwind family for the reed instruments that's going to be the reeds doing the main vibrating and making the sound and the flute family the air is going to vibrate across the opening like blowing across the top of an empty bottle and of course the amplification is going to be the body of the instrument either wood or metal how about the timbre well those mouthpieces are really important to how the different woodwinds sound so there's a, a wide variety in the wind section Okay, we've now have three sections and we need the final section. Can you guess what it is? Well, it's one of my favorite sections, the percussion section. Now, when you think of percussion, you might think of something like this drum set and wonder if there's such a thing as a drum set in the symphony. And the answer is going to be not usually. However, the percussion section, like that drum set, is not just one or two drums. There are a lot of different percussion instruments, and they're not just drums. The percussion section offers a lot of specialized sounds, and some have specific pitches, and some don't. So remember what I said about sounds that don't really have a musical pitch, but can be considered low, medium, or high. Well, that's how the unpitched percussion instruments work. For instance, this collection of bass drums comes in four different sizes. The smallest one has the highest sound. So remember, it's not a specific musical pitch, but it's definitely higher in sound than the largest one, which is going to have the lowest sound. And then, of course, the ones in between are going to be sort of medium, medium high, medium low. All right, let's talk about parameters for the percussion section. Construction. Again, there is a wide variety of construction for percussion because, as you can see, again, it's not just drums. In fact, there's only one drum picture in this collection, and those other things are percussion instruments. Okay, let's talk acoustics. They're all similar in the fact that something is struck to make the sound. Either the head of the various drums or the bars on the xylophone, or the triangle itself, or the cymbals that are crashed against each other. The energy source, of course, is going to be the player's arms. Percussionists need to have some strong arms and some stamina. The vibrations are going to be something like the head of the drum, the bars on the xylophone, and so on. And there are a lot of different timbres in the percussion section. And I don't know about you, but the drum line is my favorite part of halftime. So there you go. Let's do a little listening to the timbre of the entire percussion section. When 
I go to the symphony, I love to watch the percussion section, especially if they're doing a more modern symphony where the percussion section is really involved in playing a lot of different instruments. Definitely my favorite. All right, let's wrap up. In this lesson, I've given you a basic overview of the four sections of the orchestra. You probably noticed that some instruments were missing. Like, where's the harp? Where's the piano? Where's the guitar? Is there a fiddle? Is the fiddle the same thing as the violin? Those are questions that are going to be answered in future lessons, so I hope you stick around and keep learning.